Well, good afternoon. Righto. Well, everyone, uh, thank you very much uh, for being here today. It's uh, nice to be in front of the cameras where I can uh, smile and maybe uh, show a different side, uh, not here talking to you about uh, border protection matters. So Australians expect us to be focused on them and talking about their issues. They don't like us being focused on ourselves or talking about each other. And that's why it's very important that today the Liberal Party room has confirmed my leadership and Julie's deputy leadership of the Liberal Party. First thing I want to do is say thank you very much to my colleagues uh, for their considerable support uh, in the party room, uh, the conversations and words of encouragement uh, that I've had with them in recent times. I'm very grateful for the support uh, that they've provided to me. We cannot allow, as I said in the party room today, uh, internal issues to undermine our work, to create a risk, a real risk, that Bill Shorten will be the Prime Minister. Now, I made a decision uh, not because I had any animosity toward Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, I made a decision, a decision to contest this ballot uh, because I want to make sure we can keep Bill Shorten from ever being Prime Minister of this country. And I believe that I had the best prospect of leading the Liberal Party to success at the next election. So I thank Peter Dutton for his outstanding service as Home Affairs Minister. I've invited him to continue in that office. However, he has said to me, and we've had a, a, a good discussion about it here in my office, he said to me that he doesn't feel he can remain in the Cabinet. My uh, position from here will be to do all that I can as a backbencher to make sure that I support uh, the government, to make sure that we're elected and that we can keep Bill Shorten from the Lodge. Australians want us to keep delivering lower taxes, lower energy bills, record spending and essential services, strong economic growth, 3.1 per cent, and record jobs growth. I believe very strongly that we can win the election if we get the policies and the message right about lowering electricity prices, about making sure that we can do more on infrastructure and particularly around the migration program until infrastructure can ca catch up in our capital cities. Uh, we need to invest more into water to get farmers out of drought so that they don't go through what they're going through at the moment. We need to invest record amounts into health, into education, into aged care and into other areas as well. Our job is to work for the people who put us here. 25 million Australians. Thank you very much. Well, Peter Dutton says he wants the electorate to know more about him, that he has a softer side. With speculation continuing that there will be another challenge, the question remains, is he electable as Prime Minister and can he save seats in his crucial home state of Queensland. All the issues we're going to be discussing with our panel. I'm joined now from Barrel in regional New South Wales by former Federal Liberal Party leader John Hewson. Bruce Hawker is a Labor campaign Even strategist said. who played a key role in the election campaign of Kevin Rudd. He's in Sydney and Canberra and in Canberra is Steve Dixon, One Nation's Queensland leader. Great to have all of you on the program. John, I'll start with you. Um, even those who were probably mm -hmm. expecting something to happen would concede that it happened more quickly than it would have been thought. What, what was going through your mind this morning when you heard that the, you know, the vote had been called on? Well, I wasn't surprised that Turnbull called it on in the sense that it had been building for some time. Um, <clears throat> but I think they, uh, the, the plotters probably thought they had a bit longer. Uh, he turned it on and uh, I think it probably was a bit surprised that they got 35 mm. votes uh, against his 48, a, seven, a margin of seven. Uh, but, um, you know, as you've been saying, it's, it's certainly not over. That's stage one. Well, it, not, 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 not just not over, John. Is, him won't is give it up. inevitable? Is there an inevitability about this now that not only will there be another challenge, but it will be successful? Well, it's very hard to see that uh, there won't be another challenge, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, not hard to see that in the end it will probably be successful. This looks orchestrated. You know, we have the vote, then we have a succession mm. of ministers. Admittedly, at this stage, just junior ministers, one after one after the other, uh, pulling out. But, um, you know, and it could, it could happen very quickly. I mean, Malcolm will try and uh, drag it out, I suppose, as long as he can. But I think they've probably taken the view that, look, it's happened. Uh, we've got a pretty good base. Uh, they might even go as early as Thursday this week rather than wait to the end of the party or the, the beginning of next week. So, you know, it's, uh, it's going to happen. Uh, but I don't think necessarily, myself, that it will just be Dutton. 
Mm. I mean, if it comes back to another spill motion, another vote, I think you'll get some other candidates putting up their hand. And I would like myself to see others put their hand up. If you're going to have to have that contest, we'll have it. And I'd encourage people mm. like Julie Bishop to actually make a stand. It's probably the last thing she wants to do, but, I mean, it's the sort of thing that I think would make a big difference. And if you, it, what's your end game? If your end game is to beat Shorten, who's the best candidate to do that? That's the sort of thinking they've well, got to go through. Uh, while Dutton will bring seats, I'm sure, in Queensland, yeah. uh, he'll probably lose them in well, Sydney I do, and Melbourne. I, I do want to, and, uh, I do want to, you know, I do want to explore call. that a little bit later. And Bruce Hawker, I suppose, right now... Um, you and others in the Labor Party would be planning on facing Peter Dutton, wouldn't you, at the next election? Well, I think that's the most likely at the moment, Stan. Uh, not necessarily, as uh, John said. There could be a, a compromise candidate put up by Turnbull uh, if he thinks that it's all over for him. Uh, but I think what we're seeing right now is what I call the drip. You know, one by one, these people are, are withdrawing from the uh, ministry and applying what I call psychological pressure on uh, the waverers. And we saw that, for example, when Rudd was deposed by Gillard. Uh, you know, at first people say they're going to stick by you, but then as the momentum builds, panic uh, sets in and people just desert in droves. And I think this is what the Dutton people are trying to do right now create a sense of inevitability. Mm. And if you don't get on board, you might miss out on a portfolio or some other perk. Yeah, but Bruce, it must be going through your mind today. You know, you think about this and you go, well, the rot started, of course, with the candidate you helped get into the lodge, Kevin Rudd, and then Julia Gillard, and then back to Kevin Rudd, and then Tony Abbott, and then Malcolm Turnbull, and now potentially Peter Dutton. Um, what is wrong with our, with our politics right now? We didn't go through the worst of the global financial crisis. We don't have the problems that Europe and the United States uh, has. Our economy is growing. We are growing jobs. Mm. Why do we see this? Well, I think part of it on the Liberal side, and we're looking at that right well, now... Well, both sides, to be honest, but is there well, something rotten with the system? Well, uh, well I think there is. Uh, and, and, of course, the Labor Party mm. under Rudd tried to put in place and have put in place some measures to protect the leader from these sorts of uh, and, pressures. And three weeks ago, they were talking about Al Albanese um, challenging Shorten if Shorten didn't do well at the by-election. So it, that's that's no guarantee either, even with it, those changes you put it, in place. It's not a guarantee, but at least it's a recognition that you need to have some stability in the leadership. And, of course, uh, one of the reasons why Labor's going well now compared to when we had Rudd, Gillard Rudd, is that they have demonstrated a fair degree of, of, uh, of stability. I think, though, on the Liberal Party side, we see much more doctrinaire politics creeping into what was once a very pragmatic party, mm. driven largely that, by Tony Abbott. And, and that has been a destabiliser. And, and that's a good point to bring Steve Dixon here. Because, Steve, I would suspect that as you watch this, you'd be thinking, well... This is the One Nation effect, isn't it? That One Nation has taken voters away from that conservative end of the Liberal Party. It's well, it's talked about a lot, and the, and the the argument here is that the Liberal Party needs to recover that base. One Nation is helping to create this. Stan, uh, and thanks for having me on the show tonight. I, I think this, I, I think this gets down to people have pretty well had a gutful of politics, and they've had a gutful of it for some of the reasons being demonstrated by the first two speakers. You know, there is no stability with leadership. We need, we need people who are going to build nation-building projects. We need people who have a vision for the future of this country. But what we're seeing is people looking in the mirror. They're reflecting upon themselves. They're talking about themselves. And, and don't discard Labor. They're exactly the same. They'll drive up the cost of energy. And all of those things are going to happen. But we but, need people who are going nation, to represent the people. But one nation, Steve, has tapped into something. We saw it in the, the Longman by-election. We've seen it in, in other elections in recent times. We've seen that state elections, not necessarily trans transferring into seats, but that taking away that vote from, from the Conservatives and driving the Liberal Party to a more conservative base. What, is, what are people looking for then? Stan, it, it, it's pretty straight up and down. We've got some very straightforward policies and media don't talk about them a lot, but we're the only party talking about cutting immigration. We were the only party talking about coal-fired power stations. We're the sort of party who wants to cut back on our debt. We're the sort of party who wants to start taxing the top 732 multinational companies. People are coming to us in droves. I'm an ex-Liberal. 
I helped form the LNP in Queensland and it's proven nothing to be but a disaster. And the problem is they're eating their own. You know, people like James McGrath, he actually stabbed Tony Abbott in the back and did the numbers Mm. for Malcolm Turnbull. And we've seen that with Ted O'Brien. They're just local blokes up our way. I mean, what are they going to do to the next bloke? How many prime ministers are we going to have? Yeah, I want to come back to you on, on this question in a minute, but I just want to ask John Houston. before we do, we're just hearing, John, as well, that Michael Keenan now may have offered his resignation, but that hasn't been accepted. I hear that, yes. Yeah, and that, that, that hasn't been accepted by Malcolm Turnbull. But this idea that the Liberal Party needs to recapture a Conservative base, was the Liberal Party ever meant to be a Conservative Party? John Howard used to talk about the broad church. Um, you know, Robert Menzies talked about the forgotten people. It was more of a Liberal, small-L party, wasn't it, than a Conservative Party? Well, I think John Howard did talk about the broad church, but he tended to govern onto the right-hand side of the pulpit, if you like to say. <laughs> he had a, a Conservative <laughs> bent. Uh, I've got a very strong view, though, that a hardline, hardline right Conservative would not win in Australia. If you give up the centre ground uh, and uh, perhaps some of the left, you are not going to win enough votes across Australia to actually gain government. And this idea that we've got to match the um, the, um, One Nation Party, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, is that a race to the bottom? The One Nation Party, to me, has been essentially a protest mechanism. I mean, a lot of people who vote One Nation don't ever expect that One Nation will govern. Uh, you saw that with Xenophon. I mean, he, made, he was a master of the stunt and the soundbite. But as soon as it looked like he might win in South Australia, the vote collapsed. Mm. I think the same is true of One Nation. So I wouldn't be running a major political party on the basis of a fringe party, trying to match a fringe party. And if that's what's driving them in terms of their anti-immigration stance and some of the other statements they're making in fav- favour of coal-fired power stations and more dams and so on, I mean, I'd be very suspicious of that it, motivation. And but, it will cost them seats in Sydney and Melbourne. But Bruce Hawker, what... What has also been a, a feature of politics of recent times is that even if you do win office, you can't govern. You can't bring about the reforms that you want. You can't implement the policies you want precisely because we have this fractured polity right now and we do have yeah. independence and we do have minor parties. So where yeah. does that position labour right now? Well, it makes it difficult unless you actually get a decent majority, certainly in the lower house... Uh, you can generally work through uh, a negotiation in the upper house. But we haven't seen that since Kevin Rudd. So now the reality is you don't have that decent majority, do you? Uh, no, you don't. And, and, and I think that is one of the problems. But if one of the parties does get a, a significant majority, then that problem goes away. But the reason that they're not getting these majorities is, is essentially, I think, because uh, the, you know, a large section of the electorate is disillusioned with what they see as being the uh, you know, the swamp, as uh, Donald Trump would call it, you know, the insiders uh, governing for Canberra and from Canberra rather than for the whole electorate. And Labor has to deal with that issue itself. I've conducted my own polling on this issue and found that 47% of the electorate have either disillusioned with the major parties and would look to uh, minor parties like One Nation mm. or have actually moved that way. So Labor, and I can only speak from that perspective, really needs to seriously engage with the sort of people who are going over to One Nation and start to listen to some of their concerns. Let's have a look at, at the two men that we've been talking about specifically today, Peter Dutton and Malcolm Turnbull. And Steve... Peter Dutton, a part of the rationale here is that he will he, he will he, he will put a plank underneath Queensland, that basically he can hold on to those seats, that they won't bleed all the seats potentially they would otherwise in Queensland under Malcolm Turnbull. Do you see that? Do you see his appeal there and being able to deliver that? Well, to the to the diehard Liberals uh, in Queensland, probably, but the issue is I think it's much deeper than that, Stan, and you touched on it. People losing touch with those two major parties. And, and I, I really think that um, John got it wrong. I, I think the world is changing dramatically. We have preferential, or I should say proportional representation voting throughout the world now. And when you look at those minor parties, they're not getting that representation that people are actually voting for in the parliament. I mean, we achieved 13.75% mm. of the vote in Queensland. In, in the state election. It didn't, we ended it was, up with yeah, one seat. Yeah because of the system that's in place. Now, it's the boys' club. It's the right wing and left wing in politics. The problem is it belongs to the same bloody bird. And the, the, the issue here, too, is that you can't, you can't direct your voters 
um, preferences either. Well, so you, you, you can't say, look, if they were all going to go to the Liberals, it wouldn't necessarily be a problem in Queensland, would it? Stan, people don't understand, in prefer preferential voting, people don't own... You know, we don't own their vote. You know, the Labor Party doesn't own it, the Liberal Party doesn't own it, One Nation doesn't. You vote for who you want to vote for. We'd just like you to vote number one for One Nation. We're pretty happy about that. So, Peter Dutton potentially holding Queensland. Uh, John Hewson, Malcolm Turnbull... Remember, you know, when he was when he was stalking Tony Abbott and he was on Q&A and it was leather jacket Malcolm and he was talking about climate change and he was talking about yeah. same-sex marriage and he, and, and he had a lot of support. Um, there was a, a sigh of relief amongst many once he became Prime Minister that this was meant to be the new change, the break with the turmoil of recent times. What went wrong? Well, that's right. I mean, Stan, he definitely came in with very high expectations. I think perhaps too high, but, I mean, the people did believe that Malcolm had a policy agenda, that he believed in issues like, you know, a substantive response to climate change, that he believed in same-sex marriage, that he believed in tax reform and a run number of other issues on which he'd taken positions over the years. Yet, if you look at when he took them and how he took them, mostly he was differentiating his product from somebody else. He wasn't actually saying that, I believe in this, this is my policy agenda. So what he's done since he's been there is failed to deliver against those expectations. Initially, all options will be on the table. We'll have a res restoration of Cabinet government. We'll have uh, no more slogans. We'll do substantive policy debates mm. and so on. And all the options came off the table and we got very little progress. Most of the problems are being kicked down the road. And people are looking for authenticity. They're looking for outcomes and he's delivering neither. Uh, I, I, At the I same time, though... I mean, there is a la loss of... I, I wonder, though, John... Lots I of mean, confidence in both major parties. Where, where is... Where is are, are people looking for that? Or, uh, you know, where is the, the reward for a leader who does necessarily stand up for what they believe in or who does try to prosecute a reform agenda? You'd remember yourself, wouldn't you, that when you were in opposition and, you know, lost the unlosable, as, mm. as they said, precisely yeah, because I, you did go out there. <laughs> but precisely because you yeah, did go I'm out there. I'm a great one to ask about this, but... <laughs> While it was important that governments focus on outcomes in the early 90s, it's much more important today. I mean, people are struggling. The average Australian is struggling with the cost of living. I mean, whether it's housing affordability or power prices or childcare or school fees or medical costs or medical insurance or whatever, those costs are going up faster than their wages, which are just flat. And what are governments doing? They're offering minimal tax relief. They're not trying to solve those problems. I mean, none of what's being said by either sides of politics is actually dealing with those issues and attempting to solve the problems. They're kicking yeah, them yeah. down the road. Mm. That's why at the last election, one in three people did not vote for the two major parties. It is a problem for the major parties, and it has been true in Europe, it has been true in the United States, although Trump notionally ran as a Republican. I mean, the major parties, the political establishment, the political elite, the insiders, the swamp, are the problem. And that's what people are, mm. are, you know, they're feeling disadvantaged, disadvantaged, so they're, but, they're reacting against but it. But Bruce, do, do, that's, you've got to reposition yourself in that context. Do, do you want to say something to that? And then I want to follow up with a question specifically about leadership. Yeah, well, I, I think that's true. I, I do think that the, that the Labor Party particularly does have to look at the concerns of these people. The research that we did showed that amongst people who were voting One Nation and uh, it, immigration actually wasn't the number one issue. It was health education, mm. cost of living. Uh, and and so you know, there was a message there that they could listen to from the Labor Party if they were prepared to actually direct it towards them without compromising on those issues which one nation is guilty of uh, exploiting, you know, race particularly. So I, I, I think that that is a very important uh, role for the Labor Party as they, uh, you know, as we enter in this next phase. And I think Bill Shorten mm. uh, needs to act like a statesman now. He doesn't have to be a hard-edged opposition leader for the uh, right now. He actually has to look like the Prime Minister in waiting. Well, Steve wants to respond to that, but... It, it, I, it, do, I it do, does, it, it does raise a question here, Steve, and that is, you know, you talk about authenticity and Pauline Hanson is often said, you know, part of the appeal is that she does have that authenticity. You talk about people wanting to... You, to you know, abandon politics as usual and, and are sick of the swamp of politics. But does it also open the door for the type of uglier side of populism that we've seen in other parts of the world and that race 
becomes an issue uh, that, that, as we saw just last week with Fraser Annick, Pauline Hanson spoke out about that. But as we can see just how, how nasty a lot of the populist politics can become. Stan, you, you touched on a very, very important point. One Nation in particular, and John, I take offence to what you said, One Nation is talking about immigration for this particular reason. The Conservatives want to bring in 230,000 a year. Labor and the Greens, they want to bring in unlimited numbers into this country. You know why they're doing it? Because they're making a quid out of it. We can't cop the, the amount of population coming in here. We, can't, we don't have the schools, we don't have the roads, we don't have the infrastructure. Our population has grown beyond the expectations of anybody within this country. And we don't have the jobs to cater for these people. Our debt has now reached nearly $600 billion. And, John, I thought you were a bit of an economist. Obviously, you're not. And the Libs have got it wrong. Labor's got it wrong. We have to cut back on immigration. Our policy is very well, clear. Well, 75 in, 75,000 out. We cannot... And it's a, it's a hiatus. And we need to take a deep breath. Clearly what, what's happening now, John, and, you know, I don't want to get involved in the ins and outs of, mm. of population and immigration policy, but there are a couple of issues here. Immigration is one of them. Climate change, energy policy is another. That are as much about ideology as they are about policy, aren't they, John? Well, there's an element of that. I mean, just on immigration, I mean, you cut immigration substantially. And I'm not against a, a debate on this, but if you cut it, you will reduce our growth rate and you will increase our debt. You'll increase the budget deficit. So the economics of it are pretty clear cut and it's been demonstrated over a long, long period of time. Uh, the debate about climate isn't so much about ideology. I mean, the science is in. It's, it's really uncontestable. The challenge is how we make the transition to a low carbon and, society. And, and, that's, and, that and that's been the failure. Decades. And that's been the failure of politics, hasn't it, Bruce? I mean, we're talking about leadership once again because mm. we have seen a failure of policy to deliver on this. And I just mm. want to touch on this, Bruce, as well, to finish. The, when, when a leader is toppled, we saw it with Julia Gillard and Kevin Rudd. We saw it when Kevin Rudd came back. We saw it with with uh, with uh, Malcolm Turnbull and Tony Abbott, and potentially Peter Dutton, if he becomes leader, will face the same thing. That you're you're poisoned at the well, aren't you? That you take the worst aspects of what came before, and it, it hobbles your own leadership. And part partly that's that's what we've seen with Malcolm Turnbull, isn't it? Uh, it, it is, and, and it, it, it's a case of deja vu all over again. You saw the sort of problems that Labor had being repeated by the, the Liberals with their challenges, and, of course, it all started when, uh, when, when Abbott uh, rolled Turnbull over climate and then mm. forced Rudd into a, uh, an, ign an ignominious retreat over, uh, uh, over, um, cl over uh, trading, emissions trading. And this is the same issue that keeps coming up again and again. So I actually do think that there's a lot of ideology in this, even though the science is quite clear that we have to be seriously engaging on, uh, on renewables and so forth to make sure that you know, the planet survives, that we don't have the terrible devastating floods and droughts and, and fires that we're seeing around the world. But, but the politicians have to be prepared to make a stand on that and say, if I'm going to be a one-term government, well, so be it. You know, Whitlam did that, mm. and the things that Whitlam did uh, 40 years ago are still uh, entrenched in our system because he fundamentally changed the country. You can do it in three years. You don't need 13 well, years in government that, to do it. <laughs> and you, as you remember, that came at a cost too, Bruce. Um, it did, look, of course. <laughs> Steve, I, I know you want to say something, but I promise we, we'll have you back on. It's always good to talk to you. Bruce, a pleasure to see you, and John, as always, thank you. God thank bless you, Stan.